Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> yeah, so, uh... <laughs> I had it. I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to break. I'm not going to break. And then you went. <laughs> and that was it. All it took was for you to breathe in. <laughs> Delay is real bad. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> welcome to. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Back to the Drawing Board, an architecture podcast with me, Bill Wantler Smith, architect and director at PWS Architecture and Design, a Northeast based residential practice, and this is my intern, Theo. Hi. delay between the two of us i think which is always going to make things interesting um but this is a bit of an off the cuff episode uh where we're just going to sort of have a bit of a chat talk to me about me which i'm good at talking about apparently so uh yeah that's that's the plan uh we're doing this kind of through um zoom because as you can tell by the background theo is at university anyone who subscribes to the patreon will know that we've done a quick catch-up video together already um earlier in the month or possibly last month um but this is obviously the same type of format, but a different subject. Uh, so welcome to episode four. In this one, we're going to kind of go through this sentence. <laughs> we're going to struggle kind of through his sentence. sentence. <laughs> 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 welcome to episode four. Um, in this one, we're going to be we're going to be talking about Phil. Yeah, as he's already mentioned. We're going to kind of ask a few questions here, there, and make a bit of an interview going. Um, you know, let's just start. Let's do yeah. this. I mean, the idea is we can take some of the format from this and some of the questions and we can get some more guests on. So anyone listening to this that is an architect or has anything yeah. they want to talk about, feel free to drop us a message at askus at backtothedrawingboard.uk. There you go. We even got an email. Yeah, email. We're so professional. Anyway, yes, I mean, what, yes, what, got, what got you into architecture? Well, Aside I don't know, I've always money. been, yeah, the lucrative business of, I've always been really interested in, I've just building things. I like the idea of leaving something behind and leaving the world a better slash different place when I'm done. Um, and I can't think of a better way than the ego driven mania that is throwing up a building. I always liked as well as a kid. And I think every CV I've ever received and every job interview I've ever done, someone's gone, I loved playing with Lego as a kid. I loved playing I loved with Lego, Lego as a kid. Yeah. I loved Lego as a kid. And I that loved was on Sims. my personal statement. I know it was. You showed me your personal <laughs> statement. Um, I loved playing with Sims. So my sister used to build Sims families and I would build their houses. And then she'd just play the game, which is ideal for me because I've got zero social skills and I care not about people, but I do love buildings. So that was like, <laughs> <laughs> was absolutely spot on. Um, I mean, the other thing as well, I've always been interested in pulling things apart and seeing how they work, like to all kind of degrees and all sort of items. So that was really interesting. You just pull radios apart and stuff. And that kind this of is how we find out that Phil's a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really like pulling people apart. I'm going to Jeffrey Dahmer it. Um, <laughs> no, I just really liked, <laughs> I liked pulling things apart and seeing how they worked. And that's kind of led me down the kind of how buildings work and construction works and, and things like that. And that's probably the field that interests me about architecture as well as kind of the designing side of it is actually the building side and seeing it go together. And, and that's probably why we do a lot of detail work in the office because it's something that we're, mm. wow, I'm pretty passionate about. If you were to ask me the same question, I think I'd say what got you into architecture in a, in a much less elegant way. Uh, you've, you clearly had more time to think about that, but yeah, no, I've just been asked it a thousand I'd, times. I'd have to say, <laughs> You'd be amazed, like people come into in, right people come into job interviews and ask me what got me into architecture. I'm like, I'm not the one looking for a job here, but I'll just keep going until you make me stop because I will talk. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just I just think it's one of those really interesting professions. I always have, and I think a lot of it's it's not one of those like I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a rock star. It's probably not one of those. I think it may Cloud. have been once upon a time. Maybe it's in like the fifties in like the heyday of architecture, like the twenties, thirties, fifties and you know, maybe it's even beforehand in like all of the Victorian and Gothic and Baroque and all that stuff was probably one of those things, but I think recently less and less people seem to be passionate about it. Although mm. 
I wonder if more people were brought in by things like Grand Designs, because I know as a kid watching that, I mean, if the first episode was like, what, 1999? So I must have been six, seven, maybe, no, I'll have been five or six, depending on what time of the year it was released. So, you know, I remember watching that with my mum, like the, I think it was called the Hedgehog Society or something. They built a bunch of timber framed houses. I wasn't alive then, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As I said, it, Phil. have you never gone back in time and watched some of the older episodes of Grand Designs? Kevin's uh, got no. hair. <laughs> um, yeah. No. Yeah, it's a shock to the never. system, mate. Brace yourself. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's stuff like that that got me into it, I think. A lot, yeah, a lot of things like mm -hmm. that. Rather than, I mean, I grew up in a, I want to say Victorian era house. Um, Semi-detached, God knows how many bedrooms. Are, you know, it was kind of a big... Victorian house we had all the kind of wood panelling and stuff like that on the walls we had an Arga that ran the central heat and it was a pretty old house and I liked all of the the intricate details of that and there was a few things that I've always carried with me about that house and I think the Victorians did architecture pretty well but one of the things I've always carried about that house is as you came through the front door there was this huge atrium staircase and at the top was um, a Velux uh. that had light coming down yeah, I mean, you've just gone, oh, you know exactly every project I've ever done. Yeah. Suddenly, it all makes sense. <laughs> That's why Phil's the way he is. But it was... It's all just trying to remind you of your childhood, taking you back <laughs> to a happy place. <laughs> I don't know about happy place, but yeah, it's... Yeah, I think that's been, always been pretty formative, but I suppose it helps that I was born into a house with some architectural merit. You know, it wasn't a... You know, I mean, you saw my old house, the 70s... Well, it was it was it must have been a seventies uh, council house. It was awful. Don't say that number. Yeah, there's no there's no joy in that house, and I, I suspect people born into places like that might not be as inspired as I was. And so I guess I was. Mm. It's a good combination of getting lucky. You know, you, you can't kind of rule that out. But I think that's yeah. that's pretty much what got me into it. And I've always been told that I would never be <laughs> never be good at it. We've got school reports to say Phil is. Um, this that and the other and will never you know never amount to anything um and even though i've always kind of wanted to be an architect it seems like one of those it always just seemed cool but it always seemed like people were against the idea of me doing it and yet here i am mm. but i suppose as we go through this we'll probably learn a bit more about the journey that got me to doing all nighters in the middle of a week and drinking 14 cups of coffee a day and also designing buildings 14 that's child's play no, I'm trying to cut back. So I started by cutting it in half. The 20, 28 was unhealthy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 27, I would say there's the borderline before and I mean, this, by the way, isn't me saying maybe. This is me saying I'm full of caffeine. Yeah. So while you're in uni, do you reckon there are any projects that had a big kind of impact on, on actual projects you've ended up doing and kind of impacted on, on getting you to where you are now? Yeah, I suppose when I, I suppose when I think back, a lot of the projects we did at university were kind of visitor centres and there's a lot of master planning and things like that. But <clears throat> one project that really interested me and I've always kind of looked back on it was we did a scheme um, in a place called Druridge Bay. And in that scheme, and I may have shown you the pictures before, I did a, a hostel that was floating on the uh, on the river, mm -hmm. on the river. Oh, uh, yeah. And I think that was my, I was in third year. And it was probably one of my favorite ever projects because it was when I realized I like doing little, I like doing little buildings. I can do big buildings, no problem at all, but I quite like little buildings. And in my head, little buildings yeah. becomes residential. And I think it's looking back on it, certainly it's kind of lined a few things up where I've gone. Actually, I like little buildings because I like people kind of working with these little buildings and doing all these intricate little things and how people experience buildings. And then that leads me into residential, which is what we do here. Um, I mean, yeah, we've got some commercial jobs, but the main thing for me has always been residential. I've always enjoyed kind of seeing how people interact with spaces and, and what what impact we can have on people's lives by the things we do and the choices that we make in our design. Obviously, we're guided by the client, yeah. but you know, the decisions that we make to kind of bring that to life. But I think that's probably one of the major ones. I mean, the first one of the first projects we did at the end of first year as well was a... Uh, a sort of a, a semi-residential so you we were given a brief which was a client's hobby and a client's business and i think i got a violinist 
and a coffee shop. And so we were, then we were given a, a, it was kind of like an infill plot in the centre of Newcastle. And obviously downstairs was your cafe and then upstairs was the residential accommodation and I put a recording studio on mm. top and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's a really weird thing where the, if I remember rightly, on the first floor was kind of all of the, um, it was all the bedroom spaces. And then mm -hmm. the master bedroom had a mezzanine, which was where the living space was on the second floor. Because on the second floor, if you were living up there, you could see all around the city. So I'd already gone into upside oh, down, nice. upside down living in advance. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think, <laughs> I think those, those are two that kind of spring to mind. I mean, second year we did a bridge, which was really interesting, but that was a group project. Um, and then we, oh, actually saying that we turned a mausoleum into a theater. Um, pretty interested in the idea of a mausoleum, not so interested in the theatre. He says doing a theatre pavilion in Iceland currently. So, <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's, there's probably a few projects in, especially in the bachelors. And then in the masters, it certainly was a lot larger in terms of its projects. Um, but I think I got a lot of my sense of satisfaction from the the thesis project where we talked about or i did the ghost hunting hub in the old cooperage on the quayside mm -hmm. which obviously is, if you're leading your own brief you get a little bit of passion in that but other than that because i was working at the same time and i started pws then i was doing residential work during that period anyway yeah not for university but you know during that time but i would say that it's probably little projects like that and that little dabble in in residential up front that helped me to kind of realize that's what i wanted to do and i think that's having worked in a go. few yeah and having worked in a few big practices over some summers and spoken to other architects and, and things like that realized that the big practices just weren't for me kind of little fish big pond as as much as it sounds like a bit of an ego trip to say i love running my own business <laughs> and being the guy in charge it was more about knowing I was having an impact on the design. Yeah, it helps the control freak side of you as well. Yeah, massively, <laughs> massively helps that. Helps the ego, helps the control freak. Yeah, I think work, working with you, I've kind of, I've felt that as well. It's nice to know that, actually, <laughs> that I'm a control freak. No, no, that <laughs> I'm like when I'm when I'm doing the design, even if obviously, obviously you're helping me guide me along the way, I'm still having because it's like the two of us working on it, I'm having a big impact on this project. And it's like, it's nice to know that actually my skills and use aren't being diluted by this massive team of people. And when you're working on smaller bills, you get to do that, don't you? You get to kind of have a bigger impact. Yeah, I'd, it's always been about that for me. Like I say, I've always wanted to design mm -hmm. something to leave something behind and having yeah. my name and my stamp on something is always important to me. Again, I think architects are just ego driven mostly, but it's like, <laughs> it's, it's probably something you can't get out of mm. in this profession anyway. I know there are people who love the idea of kind of just being in a, a little part of a big team and that's fine. And then you'll find people in your course and you might end up deciding that that's what you want to do further down the line. I didn't know I was going to end up like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you had any particularly bad experiences and projects that have made you kind of make changes in, in, in the way you've gone down in the way you've progressed through your kind of your career. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be, there's, o there's always without fail, there's always going to be projects that you probably, especially during them, you probably don't want to do the job anymore. Um, but then afterwards it's <laughs> the ones that leave a bit of a laugh, a lasting after effect. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's certainly a few, I mean, we did a, I think one of the big ones was a care home we did. Um, I won't name names obviously, but we did a care home. It was an extra care facility for people, uh, sufferers of dementia, which is something that's kind of in my family and something that I've seen kind of happen firsthand. So I was really excited when the project came, uh, onto the scene and, you know, within the office and I jumped on that with like kind of both hands and was like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll take lead on that. Um, and it was just, I think the, the issue with it that kind of made me quit, it, it, it did make me question like the entire profession for us for a moment was mm. that in that 
in that project, we were working as a design and build and the design. So the, the uh, previous architect had designed it, passed it through planning. And I think they'd done some very, very rudimental kind of section lines or whatever through this building. Um, and then passed it on to a builder to price it. And then that builder employed us as their architect to do. Um, so our client was the builder and we had to do this tech package. Right. And I think there must have been some sort of clause in the contract or something, or maybe it's part of design and build. Cause it seems to happen every time I've experienced a design and build contract that save money where you can. And mm, there was yeah. a few instances where. And I got, I got emails that were, what's the cheapest legal flooring we can put in this room? Or how can we, like, can we just take out these lovely wooden handrails and reduce them down to hollow plastic? And it was things like that. And it wasn't necessarily, you know, you always have a bad experience with people asking questions or demanding drawings or asking this, that, the other, or changing things here and there. Not necessarily a bad experience, maybe, but it can become frustrating. But this was like changing drawings to affect how someone lived in an environment that they're not necessarily asking to be in, in a way they don't know that, Yeah, but, you know, we, we ended up adding extra rooms, which made other rooms smaller and it ended up kind of almost feeling a bit prisony. You know, we were taking windows out of, or yeah. making windows smaller. And I always, I always like to put myself in the feet of people in the shoes in the feet of people in the shoes of people who would be using the, <laughs> you would be using the end product. So you'll know from when we've done projects together, where I've talked about the journey through the building and how people will operate the, the building itself. And so putting myself in the shoes of these people was, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they are. And they wake up into a white hostile environment. That's wrapped in plastic. So it's, easy clean if there's any messes or for when someone eventually passes to the great beyond and then you walk into a bathroom that has no windows and is lined with plastic and the floor slopes slightly into a drain and there's a mm. horrible shower curtain that will eventually get covered in mold and everything's white plastic and cheap and it it's just one of those things that that broke me and i saw the project through because i started something and i was going to finish it but it was definitely one of those that yeah it broke my spirit quite a lot and it did make me question and did make me for a long time consider quitting completely, not just the the job and the practice I was in at the time, but completely quitting architecture and walking but away. the profession. Yeah, it was So brutal. what did you do after that? So, I mean, after that project, um, there was a couple of loose ends. I had a long, a very long um, notice period on that particular place. I'd been there for a long time and I was quite a pivotal part of the team. Um, so mm -hmm. I did finish off some of the projects, some resis, um, but a couple of, there was a synagogue we did, which was interesting. It was, oh uh, yeah, it, it, this is probably, that was probably was one that of those the, projects. the concrete that, one? Um, yeah. The one that was a whole specialist jobby where the ground was concrete, the walls were concrete and the roof was concrete all poured. I think they said they wanted yeah. to do it in Mungo. Um, I mean that project at the time was an absolute nightmare. Um, because yeah. it was, again, another design and build, but it was very intensive and very kind of specialist. And that there was one a lot wasn't of a cheap one though, was it? No. Yeah, no, it that wasn't. was like full on. Yeah, but it was, but it was, it was full on. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. Um, and at the time I hated it. Well, I hated it. I think that's a strong word, but I didn't like it at the time. And it was, it was asking a lot of us at the time. But now looking yeah. back on it, I think actually it was a really nice, cool project. Um, so I don't begrudge that one. I do begrudge the other, but, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I finished off a couple of jobs there. And then after that, the plan was to work, um, with a friend of a friend who had started his own practice. And I suppose as part of my mm -hmm. journey into becoming an architect at the time, I needed to find a, um, an architect who would oversee my work and sign off my professional uh, development records so that I could pass my part three and become an architect. So I was yeah. planning on leaving. Uh, I already had PWS, but obviously I couldn't work for myself to sign off my own work because I wasn't a qualified architect to sign my own <laughs> drawings, um, sign my own PDRs even. So I was going to go work for a friend of a friend, um, but he pulled the, the plug on that. Um, and so I ended up working for myself, but that was the plan was to leave there and go work for someone else who had a few residential projects that he wanted me to basically chair whilst he did all of the commercial jobs. And that was how he planned on running. It was going to be him obviously lead 
running all the commercial jobs, running the practice, and then me just and doing, doing the bread and butter ready. residentials to bring a trickle <laughs> of money through constantly, month in, month out. And then the big hitters from his commercial work would be bonuses and everything like that on top. Yeah. Obviously worked right. a treat, worked a dream, because here we are. <laughs> I mean, there's been some other, um, there are some examples of residential <laughs> work. Ooh. There's been some examples of residential work as well, where I think they've let, they've left their mark, should we say. Um, but it's usually with residential, it's, it usually comes down to the client rather than the actual project itself. Um, project, yeah. And you can always, you'll always have a, you know, there's probably no getting out of it. You'll always have a, a client that turns out to be what people describe as a, a nightmare client. And it's usually just a difference of opinion or it's usually just kind of a, something changes down the line inevitably um be it the budget be it what they actually need from the house or just be it a personality conflict between the two of you and it can always happen and i've seen it happen not a project i was working on but a project uh, um one of my directors is working on at a different firm and they just had an ego clash essentially was the best way to describe yeah. it and watching that unfold was terrifying and i hope that never happens so touch wood <laughs> it doesn't happen but you never know kind of to counter that, what are some of the, the best jobs you've had and how have they helped you to get to this point? So I think it's hard to define a best job. I think um, they've mm. all got that. I think the they've all got merits. So, I mean, we've done jobs where it's not a particularly glorious job. It might not be what we, you know, we in the office call website fodder. It's probably never going to see, you know, Instagram <laughs> or the light of day, but, but the client was amazing. And that's, yeah, that, that's, that's one way of looking at it. I suppose another way of looking at it is a job that I've been really interested in, invested in. So there's, there may, there might be a few that probably fit this idea, but obviously things like, um, the loft conversion we did that's on the website, that one, the one um, which is just finished, which we went to visit. No, 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 no. The one, um, no. The one that's, I'm trying to think of a way of doing it without disclosing any information. Um, the one that's, <laughs> the one that's on stilts. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get the website up now. <laughs> yeah. So you'll, it's the one that's on the front of the website when you open it up on the reel. Um, uh, yeah, that one. Uh, yeah. The loft yeah. conversion that's like, the, kind of with the, with the, it's, yeah. it's not an A-frame. It is. Or is it an A-frame? Yeah, it technically. Is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know the one you mean. That was... It's very similar to the in-laws' house as yeah. well. Yeah, I think it was... With I that, think people that have gone through facade. a bit of a... Yeah, people <clears> have gone through a bit of a phase of having these peaked glass things, and that just happened to be what they wanted. But, I mean, that's... Yeah. That was concept A of three concepts. Um, but that, I really liked that one because when I went to go meet them, they'd been told by other people that they needed to do an extension over the garage. And... You know, two of the proposals we made were an extension over the garage, but it limited and it made some of the rooms smaller and it it just, I don't know, it seemed a bit of a cop out. And then there was this storage cupboard at the back, which we then used as the door into this room that we extended out the back. Um, and then using the using that, we obviously extended the bedroom and it had the stilts and then on the side of that had lights in it. So they had like a sheltered seating area. It kind of, it was a multifunctional space just from this extension and it, that's probably one of my favorites because it was one of those where someone kind of took us up on our weird offer, I think is the best way to describe it. <laughs> it was just a, it was a weird idea and someone, and they just loved it and they rolled with it and hopefully it's going to get built sometime yeah. next year. I mean, they've, um, they've just found out that they're having oh, a, kid, I thought a child. Good. No. So they were, they've mm -hmm. just found out they're having a kid. So they kind of said, we might just give it a few months. Um, and then sort yeah. of assess it once they, once they know what they're jumping into with the kid. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously I can, I'll never kind of knock the in-laws' house because that was the first ever PWS project and it was a pretty interesting... Because you made it. Yeah, it was a pretty weird and interesting scheme. And then there's a few, I suppose, that I always think back on and that I've always really liked, but maybe never happened. So there's, there's one in particular I'm thinking of where we basically, it was a kind of a copy and paste house that was built up, I think, in the 1950s. And it was part of a, yeah. a big kind of development area. Um, and the road looped around and there was houses in the loop. And then there was a road that ran through between. And 
Anyway, so you would only access it from here and you came down and the house was on the corner. And part of my concept for them was we, f so we flip the house so that as you drive down here and the driveway is here and the entrance was down this bottom end of the house, what they having to do is drive, pull into the, pull into the, uh, the on the road and then walk <laughs> in through the entrance. So I, I got really into that one because we completely flipped a house and by doing that, we changed what was the front garden, what was the back garden, where the garage was, uh, and completely changed the way a house worked. And then uh, they didn't go with it in the end. <laughs> they went um, <laughs> with basically putting an extension on the back and walking past their bedrooms to get to their living but dining rooms and stuff. And yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, oh, it wow. felt like a waste opportunity, but that concept, I think, is probably one of those really good examples in my head of what's achievable when you kind of think outside of the box. And it's one of those kind of, yeah, it stays with me as well. So when I do new projects, I always look back on older projects to see what ideas were kind of proposed that I think would probably work and what kind of notions, not necessarily stealing design ideas from myself or, you know, taking those design ideas into someone else's as a copy and paste, but more of a, what philosophies and principles can we take from successful designs or things that yeah. we liked? Um, so there's, yeah, there's always going to be, I think a lot of projects that we've worked on over the years that will make that list, but some that might be kind of unexpected given I enjoy residential. Um, oh, I don't know where to start with that one either. <laughs> um, I mean, we did a recording studio once, which obviously it helps that I'm obviously I'm into recording. I was, I was a musician guitar. Um, so, I mean that we did, you did something studio. to do with a podcast as well, didn't you? Yeah. Some sort of podcasty thing. I can't think what <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it'll come to me eventually. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. and there's been some, <laughs> there's been some sort of un, un residential things. We did a garage that looked like a derelict, um, castle and we've done, uh, all sorts of odd things like that and they might not be big glorious projects but they've always been interesting and i just i think yeah. i'm trying to genuinely i'm like, looking back on like all of my jobs and thinking are there any that any commercial jobs that have that would actually make that list other than kind of like the wc and the gin closet projects you know the two bars those commercial jobs really yeah, interested yeah. me, but they were of a small scale and it was mostly interior design interior fit out and stuff which <laughs> i guess isn't yeah, I don't know. It's definitely ones that I've enjoyed and have inspired me. I, I and think me going. it's, for me, it's quite interesting seeing projects you've done like them where they are mainly the interior, because I know that your that's not your focus. <clears throat> your focus is kind of on the, on the structure as a whole. And then obviously you add those suggestions, of how you could use the interior. <clears throat> so it's interesting to see where you've kind of, I guess prescribed and designed the entire inside how actually you almost use your skills completely different. It's a, it's a completely different skill set that you've still got access to. And I guess it's, it's interesting seeing the way you jump between those depending on the project. Yeah. I mean, not I really think a question, just an observation. <laughs> well, it's one of those things where I think when you're in a, a big practice, you can have a knowledge base that's, like an inch deep, but a mile wide. So you can have so you can like dabble you mm. into so many different things. Whereas when you kind of by yourself, you've got to be the jack of all trades. You've got to have like a knowledge, yeah. you know, a knowledge base that you're not going to become a specialist in something in particular, but you've got to have, you know, as much as we can say, we specialize in residential, we do eco stuff. We've worked like things like that. Yes. It's a specialism. Yes. We're good at it, but we've also got to deal with all the other things. And so we've got, I've always got my kind of idea on things like that. And I always like to kind of, I like to see things through to as far as someone will take us. Obviously I can't, mm -hmm. I can't afford to do it for free. Someone would have to pay me to do it. But if someone was willing to kind of give us the, the reins of, right, just do some in, like some interior stuff. And you've done it yourself when we've done concepts when we do the concepts, we're also yeah. thinking about the interior layout and we're thinking about interior features and how we how can... that space would work. Yeah. And how little interventions into spaces as well. You know, like when, when I did that vertical bedroom instead of the horizontal bedroom, mm, you can pull yeah. together those 
you know those little those little details but thinking about that up front helps massively with the concept with planning with detailed design all of that it all lines through in the end and if then they say to us well we'd like you to design the whole interior get in this one could be fun but uh or risky even what's your ideal client <laughs> except from one that just says design me a house yeah i've got I, unlimited budget <laughs> funnily i don't know that <clears throat> i don't know that my ideal client would be someone who wants a new build i'd happily take someone with an unlimited yeah. budget i'll take that <laughs> i'm happy with that idea <laughs> um, but yeah. i guess it's i do like new builds i enjoy doing them um mm -hmm. because you've got less constraint you've got a bit more kind of opportunity to do something without limitation you know ignoring budget ignoring style ignoring all of that stuff but for me i enjoy old buildings um and i don't mean like a 30s 20 i don't mean like you know council house type jobs where it's kind of just a you know there's nothing wrong with those i'm not a knocking anyone that has those. yeah I, i'm i'm talking something with something that's got history something that's a bit you've got to really think about it so for example um you've this, got to match the character yeah and or completely oppose the character and work with something that yeah not because i can guess if i look at a, you know the house that you, we were in last that 70s um council estate houses i can tell you exactly how it's built there's no question mark really it's got a trust roof it's got it's built of um, block work inside and brick outside it's got a cavity that's going to be x wide there's a solid concrete floor old houses have got yeah. so many surprises with them and so many things to kind of exploit and utilize and as well they're also bigger and nicer and i mean <laughs> this is a probably a good example where we've got what used to be a dormer we've got a purlin knocking around at me noggin level if i stand up i give myself a concussion it's little things like that and reading the history and kind of using that as well um so i think it would be someone with an old property and it would be someone who potentially has i would say maybe it's even like a derelict property so yeah i always think about and we've, i've done this a, a few ruin. times oh, I'd love, yeah i'd love a ruin i'd love to design something on a ruin yeah, yeah. i mean I, I've, I've done <laughs> i've done projects before in not necessarily derelict buildings but in we did a, um, some barn conversions and the initial <laughs> idea they had that they wanted to do was just convert this barn and put an extension on the back and, and this that and the other and we i think in the end um we actually we didn't do the whole barn convert the, the whole barn didn't convert we converted i think it was about probably um two-thirds or maybe it's like 75 percent so three quarters of it was actually converted living space and then that other quarter we used for kind of like an outdoor sheltered um like terrarium style thing so we had like plants growing in it was inside but also outside and we took the roof off that bit and it was for me it was doing something not obvious with something that was quite obvious as well um so i'd love something because yeah. with ruins i think if you walked into a building like this house for example if you come into this house and i said right well i'm going to take down a third of the space and turn it into outdoor space by removing the roof someone would just go are you mad get out um but if it's a derelict building it's not technically a space already you know it's hard for someone to kind of be attached to that idea so i'd love the idea of a ruin and bringing something back to life i'd also love the idea yeah. of someone who wants to to go as eco and as off-grid or whatever as possible um and someone who's happy to kind of use and i suppose my house is going to be the example of this when we get around to talking about that um of using kind of the traditional materials like the lime the low voc type um breathable materials what about experimental ones yeah i mean i'm totally up for obviously i'm up for experimenting with anything um take that as you will like for example those uh solar tiles you sent us yeah yeah i mean those it, are those are cool if yeah i mean if someone's willing to kind of do that i'm totally in for doing it and i'd love a client as well who's got that kind of weird experimental twist i think um yeah i don't know it's really hard to define someone really obviously someone with a, like a boatload of money would be great because stuff like that costs a lot of money which is i suppose unfortunate but then i suppose another type of ideal client for me would be someone who wants a little tiny house and 
Yeah. I mean, we obviously have spoken to people have, who want to do like little shepherd's huts for Airbnb and glamping. I was going to say, have you, have you done any tiny houses yet? Yeah. Um, I mean, technically that project I mentioned before in Drew Ridge Bay was technically tiny house. Um, because it was kind of like a floating hostel of different sized pods, which had different sized people in um, and had kind of where there was yeah. one that was like a self-contained studio and one that was a one bed, two bed, and then one that could fit 12, up to 12 people in. But I have, I've designed some um, to a degree in the past, but they've never actually kind of been realized. So there's yeah. always kind of projects that you'll do that will never get realized. And that was one of them, unfortunately for me, but it's in the pipeline of something I'm going to do myself if all else fails. Um, mm. I think our office will probably, when we do our office extension to this house, that will encompass a lot of tiny house principles, you know, making maximum use of space and, and, and little things like that and fold out, fold up, fold round, turn, you know, multifunctional, <laughs> multi-use spaces, services, things like that. That that type of stuff also excites me. So I would hope, you know, I mean, if someone wants to convert a ruin and put a tiny house onto the side of it for whatever reason, let me know. Um Get in, get in touch. Yeah, get in touch. My my contact details will be at the bottom in the description. Yeah, <laughs> I think that would probably be my type of ideal client. And yeah, that that would suit me down to the ground. And I don't care where they are, as long as they're in the UK. Because I'm yeah, I, I would have to pay extra on insurances to do one abroad. But you know, um, don't have to learn new regulations. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah, that's a nightmare. But yeah, I'd love to do something like that. Be it. I mean, I'd also like to do an upside down house. I'd, I'd love to do something that's, I'd love to do a paragraph yeah. 79 house, you know, one of outstanding architectural merit. I'd love to work with the scheduled ancient monument, a grade one building, but you know, all of those things could probably be clustered into that one project. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. That's the, I suppose that's probably what I would call my ideal client or my ideal project. Um, certainly something that would like, if someone emailed through, I would jump on that. <laughs> yeah. And this one I know you might struggle with, but what are your favorite architectural styles? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got a few that I think, to, right. I suppose to refine that, to design in or to look at. Let's start with to look at. Okay. So I'm, this may come as no surprise. I'm a huge fan of like Gothic architecture. I'm a huge fan of... What? Yeah, I know. Feels like goth. Um, Who knew? Massive fan. Of, I am a massive fan. And it's it comes down to a number of things. Obviously, there's a lot of... I'm going to call it poetic architecture in, in Gothic architecture, where mm. it's kind of... It's about beauty. <laughs> it's about kind of... You know, especially when you look at things like churches, which I think Gothic, ch you know, church architecture is probably the one I look it's at the speed. most. It's It's about power. We say hungry, we devour. <laughs> Put the work. Oh, no, no, the rest of the week's are. So yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, it's odd because I'm a huge fan of Gothic, um, and with Gothic, I'm a huge fan of um, things like the Art Deco because I quite like ornamentation because I feel like it's the craftsman level type stuff. So you know, when you put things in there, you mm. know, your Gothic, your um, your Baroque, and and your sort of classical, it's all heavily detailed, heavily ornamented, and I like that. But I also really, really like minimalism and brutalism and like the Bauhaus movement and stuff like that. I really like because yeah. it's very minimal. I can't, you can't win. Bauhaus? Yeah. But you never heard of Bauhaus? B-A-U-H-U-A-S? Yeah. So they were... Um, oh, okay. I was, I, was, I was thinking for some reason Art Deco when you said that. And I was like, that's totally not minimalist. <laughs> No, it's a German... <laughs> like, it's like the opposite. It was like a German uh, school. I think it was like the, I want to say, early to mid-1900s. Um, but yeah, they did like... Um, I mean, there was a lot of... I think it was in Weimar, I want to say. It's been a while since I've had to think about it. But yeah, I mean, they, they did a lot of... A lot of everything, really. It wasn't just architecture. It was like art and you know pottery and, and all sorts of stuff like that and it was like a private school and they had like a they did a lot of stuff with like kind of colors and shapes and uh, yeah you'll have to look it up but you'll and, and you'll probably learn about it during you know architecture school but that was something i was always really interested in and i always quite like but it's it's Today odd we did romanesque yeah i really like the 
I really like the ornamental and I really like the non ornamental and it's a bit of a weird one. Like you can I can quite happily stare at particularly the Ameri- America in nineteen twenties and thirties where you think about like the Empire State Buildings and Flat Iron and stuff like that. Yeah. That stuff's really cool, like the Rockefeller. But then So if you had to pick a play a place and a decade, do you reckon that's what you'd go for? Ah, oh, that is a good question. A place and a decade. <laughs> a place and a decade. And then a place in a decade that you would absolutely never go for me. That's <laughs> as easy as England in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it would be, a, it'd be America in the 50s, I think. Yeah. I know I've mentioned the 20s and 30s a lot, but in the 50s you had like... Um, a lot of things like Mies van der Rohe, you had Philip um, Johnson, Philip Glass, a lot of the... I'm just going to Google some of those, actually, two seconds before I go into that. <laughs> well, make sure it's right. Yeah, because I don't want to shoot myself in the foot. Good grief, I was right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, admittedly, you know, Philip Johnson, does, you know, they, that era, I suppose, in the 50s and that, they were experimenting a lot with glass steel frame. Um, and you, you look at things like, I suppose... Um, like the Barcelona Pavilion and stuff. I know that's not America, but the Barcelona. <laughs> be seated for this. That's in Barcelona. Um, but the bar like just no. things like that, where it was kind of where they stripped it back to just being basically glass and steel, and movements like that, mm-hmm. and the Eames and everything. It's stuff like that really exciting. Like Crystal me. Palace. Because <laughs> Crystal yes. Palace was a lot of controversy. I like. I like what they were trying to achieve with it. I'm not mm-hmm. too enamoured by the end product, but I think, <laughs> I think as a as a kind of experiment and a case study, I think it was a, a a really cool piece. And you can't argue with how bonkers it was. Like yeah. here's this slender steel it's... frame covered in glass. Walk inside, see what happens. You may die. Yeah. So going back to kind of the original question, what's my favourite style? If I had to pick one. Um, Still, I still struggle with that one. I would probably say... Yeah, well, okay. Imagine I've got a gun to your head. <laughs> okay, I'm imagining it. If you had a gun to my head, I would say... Probably modernism and postmodernism. I would say. Because as much as I love the decoration of the Art Deco and the Gothic and the bra and all that stuff... I think I just love the simplicity and I think as well it's more applicable to a modern era, obviously, because that's what I'm living in and that's what mm. I've always kind of designed to the tastes of. A lot of the clients will probably have that as their ideal. If I held up a Gothic cathedral next to a postmodernist glass box and steel, nine out of ten clients would probably pick the glass box for steel. So The glass box. Yeah. yeah. And as, as a people pleaser, that's probably why it's my favourite. <laughs> just subliminally gone what would make most people happy. Yeah, I think that. Yeah. So I would say that's probably my favourite style, my least favourite. And I, the issue is, I try to find merit in everything, um, in all sort mm-hmm. of forms of architecture. Um, so it's hard. I I struggle with anything other than, is it a style of architecture like England from like the nineteen fifties to the nineteen? Well, probably actually till quite recently, like these little mass development houses that are going up everywhere that's my issue and that's the architecture yeah. i don't like i don't know if it's technically a style other than cop out i think is probably the best way to describe that style um yeah that's that's copy and paste yeah I, just uninspiring and and again not knocking anyone who lives in that obviously i've bought houses like that and i've lived in houses like that um but they just don't excite me and I don't know if it's the architect or if it's just like the yeah. kind of romantic notion I have around buildings, but yeah, that's, if that's an era that that's the era I don't like, I see the merit in most other forms of design, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, and if I yeah. had to pick a, if I had to pick a decade, fifties America, probably, or sometime around that era in America, glass, steel. You said you loved fifties America. Yeah. I'm saying if I had to, sorry, if I had to pick one that I liked the most okay, okay and i couldn't and an era that i you know a decade i'd le- like the least God, whatever barrett home started to be honest <laughs> can't, 
Shall I put that in? Probably not. If I had to pick my least favourite, probably probably the last decade, really, where all these little kind of mass housing developments yeah. have gone up. Um, yeah, that's probably. I don't. I don't think we're sat really particularly in an air, in an era of architecture. I don't think there's any strong design philosophies knocking about that are particularly revolutionary. So it's probably a bit. Of a there's a lot answer. of everything happening, really, isn't there? Yeah, and I think a lot of people are starting to there's see a... the merit in retaining what we have rather than knocking down and starting again. And I think that I think that's Which important. Obviously, I think we're probably moving into an era of heavy emphasis on ecological architecture now, whether that moves us into the era of earth ships or whether that moves us into the era of just retaining and reusing and clever ecological features we'll see in about a decade's time i'll let you know <laughs> let's hope this podcast keeps going yeah well it's got to go at least until the end of this episode i reckon <laughs> that should do yeah I'll do how would you describe your best employee in one word me <laughs> oh, yes um not wife <laughs> oh god no um no she's the, she's my least favorite employee because she actually makes me do work i would imagine my my best mm. employee if i couldn't pick myself obviously um no you can't vote for yourself tall I'll let you decide who that is well when An atlas goes on his back legs he is pretty tall He's a bit of a beastie boy. Um, no, She's not a six foot legend, though. I don't, I don't, I don't know if um, I don't know if we'll count that question. I don't know if I can, can you do that? It's go, it's going in. Go, <laughs> um, what's your kind of what's your standard design process once you've been given a brief by a client? Ooh, so obviously step one is survey the damn house or site. Uh, whether we do that or whether or not we get someone else to do it is a different matter um but taking that existing information and the brief together um and what i like to do is and i used to do it by hand and i've started doing it by hand more and more now that i've actually bought a printer is to print off the floor plans and just start doodling and sketching and making notes mm -hmm. um so that's usually my first instance is kind of pulling together the adjacency diagram as i like to call it i think most people probably refer to it as that there's a few other definitions but what spaces make sense next to each other um and factoring in at that point we'll i'll start thinking about access orientation so sunlight wind direction if it's important for a project where the key views are and then i'll start to also think about any limitations in things like planning so mm -hmm. a good example being in the uk we have a lot of things to do with privacy distances between properties so if i can identify those things quickly i can give myself a set of parameters to work within um so you know i suppose a really good example is when someone says can we do a permitted development job and, and permit development for those who don't know in the uk is a set of rules where you don't have to get full written planning permission um it's just kind of things that you can do but you can get sign off for it anyway to say that it's lawfully developed. Now, when someone comes to us with something like that, we know what those parameters are. So my first thing in the process is setting those parameters, knowing what I can and can't do and where my boundaries are. And then from there, it's kind of a case of thinking about little, little journeys and little details and little routines that people go through in their life so sometimes i'll ask people this like what you know do you park at the front do you park at the back do you live in you you know do you have do you want open plan and if you do open plan is it a case of because you want it to be a communal space for the family or do you just like the idea of the convenience little things like that you know kind of understanding how people want to live and how they do live so once you once you've got your doodles down, at, at what point do you then turn on your software? You know, go on something like CAD and start actually setting down lines. Yeah, so that'll so that's usually once I've kind of with the doodles, I can do all of the kind of arrows and pointy like curvy lines to symbolise a journey. And then once I've got a good idea in my head of a layout and everything, I'll go into CAD to start. Um, because obviously I've usually drawn up the survey on CAD so it's millimetre accurate. And then I'll go up and I will start to kind of flesh those sketches out in millimetre accurate ways. So I know, you know, I might have drawn a room that's four metres deep on the sketch, but we can only go to three metres or something like that. But it gives us an idea. 
Um, and I'll start doing that and I'll come with some rough layouts for things like kitchens, bathrooms, where furniture is going to go, where windows might be. From there, I'll move that into SketchUp. So my 3D software. And that's when I'll start to refine things like materials and maybe shapes. It might be that, you know, instead of having one mass, we have a slightly offset mass. So it's, you know, bigger up one end or, or whatever. Um, and I'll start to look as well at, from that, I can start to look more at the shadows and more at light ingress and how, you know, scale and proportion work and window openings and stuff. And you can do a lot of that in CAD, but I always find it easier on 3D and it's just always been, my, that's always been my process really, is to get the bones of it down. So do you, tweak. Do, you do you tend to have a pretty solid idea of, of what you're going to go for with your with your designs before you then go on to uh, your 3D software? Or do you kind of throw up your 3D model and then go, actually, here's what I want to change? I've always got a good idea. I didn't always have a good idea though. So mm -hmm. I will, once I've surveyed a building and once I've spoken to a client in my head, I know what at least one option is going to be. Usually two or yeah. three options are already in there and I'll draw up to, I mean, I've done projects where we've done eight options and then I've whittled it down by taking like the greatest hits of those eight ideas into three or even some yeah. of them four. Like sometimes clients have had four options because there's just been that much on the table for us. Um, and usually that's with quite an open brief, but in the oldy days, I didn't really have that. I would have a case of just throw spaghetti at the wall and see if it sticks. It was never... Uh, <laughs> it was never that's how you test if spaghetti's cooked, do you not know? Um, We're doing a very good job of avoiding these explicit marks. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm doing my best. It's really difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, I would... No cuts have been made. Yeah, not at all. Mm. No. We would do, yeah, I mean, so I didn't always have an idea of what the end product would be, and so I would be experimenting, but I would always know in my head if I'm going to build it out of masonry, or if I know that it's going to be a steel frame, or if I know it's going to be a timber frame, I would know these rules of thumb, and I think that's something really important to have when you take your... I mean, I do it now right from the beginning, like even those weird little doodles that are on paper and aren't to scale, or, or to a rough scale... I'll take into consideration how thick I know the walls are going to need to be and how it's going to stand up and where I'll need to put steels in frame to hold up the existing building or how to put up this extension or this new build. Um, but I think that's probably a key point that people need to think about more often as well is how it's going to stand up and thinking about that. You don't need to know it's going to be this and it's going to be that particular size steel because you'll need the engineer. Or I don't know how thick the roof buildup is going to be unless someone starts talking to you up front about it being heavily insulated then you need to have a good idea of how much insulation so you know how thick it's all going to be but yeah um so nowadays do you ever i was going to say do you ever draw in 3d or do you tend to keep your 3ds to modeling on uh, computers so you'll you'll know this but for the people listening at home i am terrible at hand drawing so what yeah so i tend to i must <laughs> every time i talk to an architect they're like what do you mean you can't draw i can't draw I can draw and plan really well and I can like do all these diagrams and these layouts and everything, but I'll always tart them back up on a digital medium. I've just always done it that way. Um, I can draw in 3D to a degree, but it'll never look good. And it, I spend more time trying to understand perspective, trying to make my hands do perspective than I do just designing it anyway. But SketchUp yeah. in particular, I found as a really useful tool where I can do just blocks, white blocks and i can arrange them and push and pull and get things to a point where i go yeah that looks right if i'm doing things out of brick i know coursing numbers so i i know that every row is 75 mil or 65 of a brick with 10 mil mortar gap and i know it's 215 with a 10 mil mortar gap. i know all of that stuff and i can design things to that those proportions without thinking about it but when you start going into you know, doing things out of steel or timber frame where you've got a lot more kind of freedom, where you're not working to full and half bricks. That's when I'll start to make shapes and, you know, extrude things. And sometimes, sometimes the form follows the function, which is probably going to annoy <laughs> half the audience. Um, but sometimes I find that the <laughs> function follows the form and form follows the function. Sometimes they're interchangeable, I think. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. probably, that's a, an insight into my, design process um so have you ever presented a design to a client in a form of then as a 3d uh render or as a as a 2d kind of card drawing 
Yeah, so when we do our concept reviews, and this gets refined more and more, and the more we've done and the more we've done kind of different things, but most of the time what people will get is the existing and then our diagrams of our analysis of the site, understanding their brief, the adjacency diagram, journeys through things, you know, we may pick up on things that are good about the house, things that are bad about the house, and they'll be diagrammatical usually. And then we'll move into the propose, which is usually plans and uh, visuals, sketch visuals, photorealistic visuals, 360 panoramic visuals, axonometric, you know, things like that. And again, more diagrams is usually how we present things to clients. Um, I just find that the combination of plans so they can see how the rooms sit next to each other in scale. So if you populate the scale with furniture, that helps people to understand. But also when you get into the 3D stuff, a lot of people don't understand elevation because it's an orthographic drawing, it's lines, and that throws a lot of people. So I'll always include um, the sketch visuals or even a photorealistic visual if they ask for it, because I think mm -hmm. it gives people a better idea of what the end product's going to be and helps them to understand materiality and scale and proportions and things like that. So I always think those two are the, the two tools we use the most, plan and elevate and um, visuals. And like I say, we've yeah. done, we've done four realistic 360 virtual reality ones before, and I love doing them and I want to try and do more of them, but it's time consuming, man. <laughs> and while you're all, while you, while you're doing all this, what music have you got on in the background? <laughs> um, <laughs> Slipped into there flawlessly. Yeah, I would say it depends on my mood is the big one. Uh, <laughs> but typically... Typ and, typically you'll... and who you've just got off the phone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so typically you'll find... Um, and what time of the day it is as well. Typically you'll find it'll be a lot of um, heavy, heavy metal. Really heavy metal, like, you know bands like as i lay dying and and stuff like that um i'm less into kind of the screamy what people in our era could describe as emo music i'm less into that more and more um if i'm in a really good mood it'll be kind of like your you kind of more pop rock so like your foo fighters and maybe it's kind of um older alternative music so trapped um lincoln park stuff like that but I'm also a huge fan of EDM. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> pick and choose, really. Um, but I'm also... And sometimes some pixel acid music. Yeah, I love a good bit of boss fight and 80s music as well. Um, I grew up, um, we used to do a lot of driving. Mongolian throat metal. Mongolian throat metal. That, com that comes under the heavy metal category to me, to be honest. Um, yeah. But the, I grew up a lot. Well, we used to drive to we had a holiday home in France and we used to drive... Um, it was like a solid 24 hours. We would listen to a lot of my parents' music and my parents were born in like the 50s. So it's a lot of 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, into the 80s. Now my brother's 10 years older than me, so he was a an 80s child. So I've kind of got a background of growing up listening to that kind of music. So that plays a big part in it, especially if I'm in a good mood. I can listen to a lot of that mm. and sing along. And well, you've been in the office when I've had like, you know, when we've been sat singing along to 80s classics and like 90s classics and uh, like cheesy power Some ballad. Some of the power ballads going. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I, I love stuff like that. And I'll listen to a lot of that when I'm driving as well. Um, but normally it's it's pretty brutal, <laughs> heavy metal and weird dark wave EDM, um, which I think people yeah. get surprised by <clears throat> when they kind of, when they get to know me and then go, Ooh, you are weird. I am weird, yes. You've got some strange tastes. Yeah. So if you if you could give it some advice to to a student about how to improve their design process, what would you say? <laughs> um, think in 3D. That's something that one of my directors said to me a long time ago, and I thought, that's complete bull. Like, what is what a weird thing to say to someone. Like, think in 3D. How can, like... At the time, it threw me through a bit of a loop because I didn't quite understand what he meant. And I think over the years, I've started yeah. to understand that. And what I would say, obviously, when I first started, no one was really... Well, the practice I was in, should we say, wasn't using a lot of 3D software. They were using a lot of CAD, um, strictly CAD. So it didn't even seem relevant. Yeah. But what he would do would be... He would 
because he'd been doing it for so long, he could say to himself, right, I know if I'm stood in this room looking at it in plan, he could say, I'm stood in this room, I can see a window there, the sill height needs to be at this point, and then the head height could be here, and then the ceiling can be there. And he would work through that process. Like just drawing in CAD, which is an impressive skill to do. Now, I, I'm not, I, I've kind of got to that point, but I think what I would say is start to design things in 3D because you're going to have to start designing it in 3D to understand how to visualize things in 3D. So draw spaces, use the look around tool in, in um, SketchUp to get an idea for things as you're designing it. Like, don't just do it when you think the product's done. Do it through the process and you'll eventually learn how pushing and pulling and tweaking and things works and kind of think about standing in spaces and what you will see from spaces. I know I've spoke to you a lot about this where it's like when you come through the front door of a house, what do you see when you come through into this particular where does it space? Draw your eye? Yeah. And one thing, well, there's probably two or three things, and I know you asked for one thing, but I'm going to give you two or three because I'm a good rambler. <laughs> um, so that would be one of them. Learn to think in 3D and learn to visualize in 3D. The next one would be learn some rules of thumb on construction and things like that. So you've got to know if you're doing masonry, what the limitations are, where you might have to put movement joints, what co standard brick coursing is. And if you're working with steel frames, roughly how you know the depth to depth to span ratios one in 20 one to 10 things like that start to think and and rhythm of um of structural grids invaluable that works for steel and timber frame as well look into stuff like that and also go on to find the joist you know calculator and stuff so that you can have a realistic expectation straight away of how thick and how big something's going to be um and then i forgot what the third one was <laughs> because i didn't just laugh at that i know yeah i would say to have fun and don't don't hang yourself onto one particular idea straight away i'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad don't you hang your sentence <laughs> <laughs> for a second i thought you were going to stop at that i was like no not quite really yeah don't, don't. that's the advice <laughs> Don't don't hang yourself up on one ideal because you'll you'll change things as you go. Um, I was adamant on certain things in the first two years of uni, and then I changed my mind completely. And and don't don't close your mind off to other ideas and talk to people, talk to your friends and your colleagues and your peers and your tutors as much as you can to have people shoot down your ideas, even if you think they're the best ideas. And I still do this now. I'll run things past Hannah, who's at my wife slash um, admin. I'll run things by her for her to go. What? Like one of the other, but never both. Yeah. Um. That's yeah. That's something I think I actually read in 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School was always be never never set yourself on the first idea and always be ready to kind of go. Something's changed, and for some reason, I can't do this anymore. And so I'm just gonna. I'm gonna I've said that to myself a, a lot about idea. architecture. If I'm honest, <laughs> something's changed, <laughs> and I can't do this anymore. Yeah, uh, I think. Um, yeah, I guess that's good advice. <clears throat> what would you say is? What would you say is some of the worst advice you've ever received? Worst advice I've ever is it about architecture or just in general? It's an architecture-based podcast, so let's probably try and stick to it. Because oh. if they say, like, strum a little less hard when you're playing the guitar, I feel like that might not be relevant. No, I was... Because what I was going to say was, lick this 9-volt battery. <laughs> 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 um, <clears throat> some yeah, of the worst yeah. advice in architecture. That's pretty bad. Some of the worst... Yeah, I, I, funnily enough, this comes from the same guy who told me to to think in 3D, which is... The client doesn't know what they want. You have to tell them. And I think... He, I'm not sure if he was coming from it of an angle of the client doesn't understand how to achieve their end product. But the way he described it to me was the client is thick. They don't know anything. Mm. Just do what you want to do. 
that was kind of the way it was received and the way he kind of when he that's a very it it. seems like a very good way to uh lose a job yeah it, well, he lost a lot of jobs and he lost a lot of money on jobs because he spent a lot of time drawing things that that the client didn't want yeah so i mean if it was on an hourly rate basis it's fine but it wasn't it was on a fixed fee so when you start mm -hmm. running over more and more time you'll lose money um but yeah i think that's probably the worst bit of advice for anyone if you take it in the wrong way which is the way he kind of described it as oh the clients are all fake and they don't know what they want and you've just got to go with what you want to do because it's your design at the end of the day um so yeah. i would tweak it slightly and say the client doesn't know what they want you have to show them what they want, but give them what they asked for, for the love of God. I mean, <laughs> he started doing all sorts of weird things like putting extra floors on buildings and coming out extra meterages and putting downstairs this, that, and the others in places. Ah, this guy was mad. But, you know, yeah. The, so that's probably the worst bit of advice I've ever got from some from another architect. Yeah. And do you think the uh, thinking 3D is the best you've got from someone else? No, no. I think I think the best. It's a good, uh, yeah. It's a good bit of advice. But I think the best bit of advice I've ever had, and I'm I'm sifting through a lot of bits in my head. Um, but I think the best bit of advice I've probably ever had was, <clears throat> don't be afraid of getting it wrong. Because I think I think people focus too heavily on, and it's probably something that has led to this kind of reduction in architecture down to copy and paste boxes, is this, this kind of idea that this is the correct way to do it and let's just keep doing it that way. I think you've got to think outside the box and you can't be afraid to do something wrong if you're going to do that because... At the end of the day, no one ever got anywhere by doing the same thing over and over again. Christopher Columbus would have never found America if he didn't go the wrong way. You would, you know, there's always going to be experimentation, and I think it's essential. Now, there's yeah. a caveat on that, which is don't experiment to the point of failure, like where you completely fail a building and kill someone. That's probably a bit too far. But even if, you know, when we do our, you know, a good example is when we do our concept reviews, and you did... I will take, for example, the one in Bishop Auckland, the people who own the stables at the back of the house. I would say... Yeah, oh, sorry. I, were you asking the question? No, no. I was, you froze. I, I was giving you a... As you said that. Oh, <laughs> damn connection. No, I was giving you an example <laughs> of, you know, when we did the house, the right. guys who had the equestrian centre at the back. Yeah, yeah. And we did two quite safe options. Then you did a really wild out there one. Uh, out there one. Obviously, you were given some guidance. It was safe because we had the safe options. Yeah, and it and it fit within the brief. But then it we fit within the brief. It fit within the parameters. Mm. It fit within what they were asking us to do. But it was out there, and I think yeah. you threw out something that was you know you th you cast out a wild idea, and I think. You know, obviously we sat down and we ran through how it would stand up to make sure it wouldn't fail, to make sure that it was an actual feasible idea. But you, yeah. but you ran with it. And I don't know whether or not that was sheer stupidity, brave heartedness, or the fact that you felt you had someone in your corner to help along, but you weren't afraid. I just spent far too long on it to not show it. <laughs> there you go. That's probably another good bit of advice is if you put heart and effort into something, do it, show it. Even if yeah. it gets shot down in flames, which that did in the end, but if even if it gets shot down in flames, you explored it. And like that example I gave you earlier about that yeah. project um, where I'd um, rearranged the entire house so it was back to front, which made it then the correct way around based on the access and everything like that. I can draw on that idea that I had and that solution to that problem, and I can take that forward into different projects. And it might not be this project. It might be not be the next project. It might be 10, 15, 100 projects down the line that you get to put a weird box on stilts cantilevering over an angled glazed corner that peels back and reveals a kitchen with a curved dining table built into the worktop. That might be in 100 projects time, it could be the next project, but you've got in your head now <laughs> and put it onto paper. And because you've done that, you've embedded that thought process into your head of how yeah. i got from a to b and now b is going to be sat there for a long time i think so yeah don't be afraid to mess something up and get something wrong 
And when you put that much effort into it, show it to someone for critique for the yeah. for the least. Get it, you know, critiqued by your wife, your admin, your friend, your intern, anyone who will listen to you. Get critiques on your bizarre ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that's my i would say is, yeah. that's the best bit of advice i've probably been given it's the best bit of advice i can probably give as well so looking back uh at university what would you have done differently i'd have probably spent more time looking at other architecture i think at the time i had this clear idea in my head straight away of this is what the end product's going to be and this is how i'm going to get there a to b and i think towards the end of it i learned a can lead to b to c to d to z like there's there's a there's a line mm. that progresses and i think i was very 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 strong uh, headstrong at first and uh, i think that's probably one of the things i would have done differently was taking more advice which i suppose leads off that best bit of advice you've been given type thing to go wild and kind of yeah. let people shoot you down um but i think yeah that would be it is to spend a lot more time looking at other stuff what other people have done and to not fix myself on one idea and just run to that point but to kind of meander my way <laughs> there and see what comes out along the way for sure yeah that's and then i think taking that question and moving it slightly forward into what um looking back at kind of either my early professional days or my early days working for myself or what i've done differently um probably have been do more out of hours work but not more out of hours work that results in it's the best way to, i'm trying to think of the best way to describe it is i would have spent more time playing around with things and yeah and kind of giving myself just having fun with designing yeah so it might be that i get you know i might design something and then later after hours just throw that down on a drawing board bit of tracing paper over the top and kind of like just clear your head onto it that's probably what i'm trying to get out is kind of give yourself that opportunity to kind of throw all your ideas down that got you from a to b or a to z via all the other letters of the alphabet as well taking that forward into kind of professional and like working for myself and working for other people what i would probably say is um i would have spent more time out of hours doing work but not work work not hard craft it would have been i mean i spent a lot of time outside of work i was doing that which is what you do in architecture for no pay but i would probably have spent more time with maybe an end product and just throwing things down onto paper like throwing ideas onto paper that may never see the light of day or might just be kind of the process it took me to get from a to b and just getting that out yeah. of my head because i think i spent a lot of time kind of not experimenting and expressing that journey and i think that's probably what i would have spent more time doing and that's stuff you should be doing at university but i figure you're already doing it so don't need to do more of it at uni but you do probably do need to do more of it in the office which is why we do all the diagramming stuff because it's that thought process and clearing your head out yeah so that's brought us to the end of, of this episode so thanks for joining us on episode four if you're listening on any podcasting platform please consider leaving us a review if you're watching on youtube please like comment and subscribe and follow us on instagram at back to the drawing board ig and please consider subscribing to our patreon for bonus content longer episodes and to help build our community we'll see you next time when we return back to the drawing board Why has it started recording? It doesn't tell you to record. Please keep this page open. You can still hang up or reload. I don't know if I want to. Cause I'm all alone. There's no one here beside me. When he joins, he's gonna see all this when he's editing it. My problems have all gone. There's no one to eradicate me. <laughs> Hurry up, Theo. I'm gonna lose my mind. But you gotta have friends. Mm. Oh, do I put the coffee on the other side? Oh, something's happening. No, nothing's happening. <laughs>
Thank you.